Let me start with a quotation from Goethe's Faust. That I may detect the inmost force which binds the world and guides its course, its germs productive powers explore and rummage in empty words no more. For more than two millennia, this universal quest for knowing what words cannot convey has been the target of explorations into the nature of the human mind. This theme reflected an, in a, is, is, is reflected in a distinction between two fundamentally different forms of knowledge, thinking versus feeling, mind versus emotion, intellect versus intuition. In fact, the history of this distinction can be traced from ancient philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, via classical literature, my favorites are Shakespeare and uh, Goethe, until recent research in cognitive science. The latter research demonstrates, for example, divergent psychological and neurobiological processes underlying explicit versus implicit memory. Normally, implicit and explicit memories collaborate. We don't even notice the difference. But sometimes they dissociate. For example, when I cannot explicitly recall a phone number, but I can dial it. That can be sometimes pretty surprising when you are not uh, aware of the fact that there are different memory systems um, involved. <clears throat> Here is my overview of the three topics I will focus upon. First, I will briefly address differences in the functional characteristics of explicit and implicit processing between analytical thinking and implicit feeling, including the implicit self. Second, I will argue why those distinct functional profiles may shed some light on several philosophical conundrums that are related to rationality, autonomy, and authenticity. Thirdly, I will expand on a topic that may have received less attention than it deserves. It is the interaction between explicit and implicit knowledge that requires more study across the behavioral sciences, according to my view. In this part of my talk, I will elaborate on one reason why an extensive investigation of the interaction between analytical and intuitive forms of knowledge is needed. Pivotal self-competences, such as action control in acting one's intentions, and self-growth depend upon the dialogue between explicit and implicit systems. That's my central thesis. Let me begin with the first topic. Here's a brief summary of four there are more, but maybe the four more interesting, empirically confirmed functional characteristic uh, of explicit analytical thinking. These features are quite consistent with uh, how Sigmund Freud described what he called the secondary process of the ego, <clears throat> and how Daniel Kahneman described what he called his system number two. It can be characterized by the following features. First, the sequential step-by-step -step characteristic of analytical thinking and language reduction. Second, when verbal external instructions or self-instructions result in explicit intentions, conscious control is an additional feature of the ego. The third feature relates to the categorical nature of explicit thinking in terms of black or white, either or, which follows from the fact that sequential processing implies successive rather than parallel activation of processing units, at least on the highest level of processing. This feature is especially appropriate when one is searching for clear-cut answers. A logical statement can be correct or false. Binary, binary logic works like that. Our math teacher, I remember, always finished one of his geometrical proofs uh, by saying, tertium non dato, we had to understand Latin as well. And that means uh, a third possibility is not there, doesn't exist. That's the way logical thinking works. Therefore, um, oh, and finally, the fourth uh, feature relates to the fact that analytical thinking should be objective rather than turn into wishful thinking. What does this imply from a functional point of view? Decoupling from emotions and body feelings seems to be a pivotal 
feature for analytical thinking to be objective. Analytical solutions should be valid independent of the emotional preferences of the thinker. We almost take this for granted, but uh, how does the system uh, make this possible? So we postulate uh, a decoupling from emotions. That pre predestines analytical thinking as a refuge, so maybe a side effect of this architecture, um, a refuge from painful or even traumatic experiences. Some people uh, move into analytical thinking just for this reason. Uh, and Freud, in Freudian psychoanalysis, it's called, or one of the a similar def defense mechanism is called intellectualization. Compared to explicit analytical thinking, the functional characteristics of intuition are more obscure. Do we have to leave intuition in the hands of esoteric deep self divers? We can buy the uh, deep self there, promising to help you find the answer to your deep self. Or can we study scientifically how intuition works? This does not appear a simple task because we cannot watch implicit processing while it occurs. One feature of implicit intuition is often described in terms of holistic or coarse processing. One task that has been used a lot in experimental research assesses intuitive perception of remote semantic associations. You can try it yourself. I brought a task, pass goat high, what do you think? Does it have something in common? Please raise your hands if you think it has something in common. Yeah, some, yeah. You don't even need to uh, say why. Uh, how about um, the next three? Bird, pipe, lamb. Do they have something in common? What do you think? Nobody raises his or her hands. Okay. And how about the third? Stick, make, or point. Do they have something in common? Mm -hmm. Wow. Very good intuit uh, intuitive people around here. Yes, uh, uh, <clears throat> that has something in common. Sometimes people correctly identify coherent triads in our experiments beyond chance without being able to substantiate uh, this implicit feeling of semantic coherence. And we encourage them to do that. Sometimes one just feels it. And if an explicit reason can be found, it often follows rather than precedes the intuitive feeling that there seems to be some coherence. Um, Jung Beeman and Ventura and, and, and some of the experts who are studying, uh, working, have been working with this task uh, for a long time, um, have uh, explored brain mechanisms that uh, make this possible. So the last word, right, stick, make, or point belongs to the coherent group, and some people can feel it even without being able to say the reason. Match stick, match maker, match point. What would be the functional basis <coughs> Of, intuitive, of the intuitive capacity to feel the coherence of triads of words in a sudden experience of insight, the so-called aha experience. Parallel processing in associative networks, so-called connectionist networks, are well suited to explain the instantaneous integration of not only three, but innumerable bits of information. And parallel processing seems a promising candidate for explaining the functional basis of the implicit counterpart of the ego, the implicit self. To make a long story short, on the basis of my 40 years of research, I have come to the conclusion that the experimental evidence on functional characteristics of that huge experiential network that we call the self can best be summarized by applying the functional features of parallel associative networks to the highest level of integrated experience. The most important features of the self as a parallel associative network are, first, such a network is the basis of holistic feeling of personally relevant experience. As such, it may have some overlap with what has been called emotional intelligence. Second, and more specifically, the self is a network making available innumerable experiences related to task-relevant personal abilities. What can I do? What uh, surpasses my abilities? Behavioral options, values, emotions, body signals, and needs. Not only one's own needs and emotions, but also others. Third, 
The integrative potential of the cell follows from one of the key characteristics of parallel processing, that is multiple constraint satisfaction, they call it MCS. Parallel connectionist networks have the potential, usually after extended training, to find a solution that satisfies a virtually unlimited number of constraints. In the case of the self, examples would be solutions to conflicts between opposing needs within the person or between uh, different persons. By taking into, a call, into account all conflicting needs and perspectives. This feature can be regarded as the counterpart of the either or characteristic of categorical thinking. We can call it the both X and Y characteristic, both and instead of either or. Yes, the human mind has a capacity that helps to have the cake and eat it too. And it is badly needed wherever people are dealing with complex systems, including themselves. Finally, the fourth characteristic of the self relates to its implicit nature. It was already mentioned in the introduction by Professor Brundtrup. In contrast to the word unconscious, we may think about the word implicit, what does it else? Is it, uh, does it mean the same thing? Why do we prefer to use it sometimes more than unconscious? To me, the attractive, one attractive aspect of the term implicit is that it includes the fringe of con uh, consciousness, not unlike Freud's notion of the pre-conscious, not the same, but the fringe of consciousness, the periphery. It goes without saying that the content of parallel processing of innumerable inputs cannot become conscious in its totality. Therefore, one cannot consciously control self-access in its totality. Activating the extended experiential network, I call it because of this extendedness, extension memory, requires letting go of control. One beneficial side of its partial uncontrollability it's not only a loss, loss of control, is that the implicit experiential network monitors the environment even if our conscious awareness is distracted. So um, it works without control. Sometimes that's pretty convenient. I'm walking home after work, looking forward to relaxing in the garden, and all of a sudden I remember that I have to turn left because I need to buy something in the supermarket located a few blocks off the way to my home. The implicit self-monitoring characteristic of the self reminds me at the right moment, even if my explicit ego is already involved in thoughts about relaxing at home. Now I invite you to reflect for a moment on this postulated capacity of the self that enables us to make decisions that integrate each and every relevant piece of knowledge and innumerable personal constraints without explicit conscious analysis. Now we, oh, I ask you, should we call this system irrational because we arrived at it unconsciously? Or should we expand the concept of rationality to include unconscious integration of reasons for action that would pass maybe even many explicit tests of rational decision making? if we would make them. <clears throat> During the past three or four decades, psychological and neurobiological research has been uncovering more and more details about those four and even more functional characteristics of what we call the intelligent unconscious. <clears throat> so we need not to blame Sigmund Freud for ignoring the, the distinction between the explicit ego and the implicit self. However, he could have known better. If he had adopted this insight of a philosopher from whom Freud borrowed the dark sides of the irrational unconscious only. I quote, <clears throat> I, you say, and are proud of this word. But what is greater is that in which you do not want to believe. Your body and it's great reason. It does not say I, but it does I. Yourself laughs at your ego and its proud leaps. Here Nietzsche mentions each of the four functional characteristics of the self that I mentioned. 
uh, it is based on feeling rather than believing. <clears throat> in this case, believing in the sense of explicit knowing. It is extensively connected with body signals and emotions. It has a wide view, which includes experiential knowledge regarding context-relevant options for action. And Nietzsche also refers to implicit rationality. The implicitness is expressed by it does not say I. And the rationality by Nietzsche's term reason. And the action orientation by it does I. It goes without saying that the theoretical distinction between an explicit ego and an implicit self and empirical research on those two systems can be made test and tested without making any assumptions about neurobiological underpinnings of those systems. Nonetheless, it might be worth mentioning that there is quite some experimental evidence suggesting that each of these functional characteristics of the self seems to draw heavily from particular networks in the right hemisphere of the brain. Whereas the neurobiological basis of analytical thinking, notably the sequential processing components of speech, seem to be more closely related to left hemispheric functions. Here are some empirical examples. Compared to the left hemisphere, the microanatomy of the right hemisphere is better suited to support multiple constraint satisfaction as required in my example, the uh, remote associates test. That is for intuitively feeling remote associations or for the integrative, the integrative tasks of the self. The widely, more widely spaced mini columns in the left hemisphere function as discrete units facilitating computational processing of more independent components that would more fit with um, analytical thinking, sequential problem solving. On the other hand, in the right hemisphere, densely spaced mini columns permit greater overlapping co-activation and therefore confer more holistic processing. The left hemisphere is activated when motives, needs are primed that involve a narrow focus on means and thinking. And I think of the motives, for, uh, the need for achievement and the need for power. They're, they are pretty um, straightforward, looking for means to a specific end. On the other hand, a motive presumably involving the self, when the self is really wanted to be involved, is the need for affiliation and personal relatedness. Personal relatedness activates the right hemisphere and facilitates detection of remote semantic relationships. We just have to prime people with words re uh, reminding them of positive or negative um, um, relatedness experiences, and they are better able to detect these um, implicit connections, connectivities between overlaps, between uh, related words. And um, implicitly priming participants with self-descriptive words obtained through prior self-report facilitates left-hand muscle contractions elicited by TMS stimulation of the right hemispheric motor cortex. We have to think uh, twice or three times about this connection uh, to get it, but it's, it's another piece of evidence uh, suggesting to some of these people who do, are doing this research that the right hemisphere is heavily involved in the implicit parts of the self. <clears throat> Locking parts of the right hemisphere, for instance, in this case, the inferior, inferior parietal lobe impairs self-other discrimination, own and uh, others' faces, or stimulation of parts of the right hemisphere, for example, by TMS or by asking participants simply to press a softball for one or three minutes with their left hands enhances self-other discrimination even of the deep, deeper type. And I will <clears throat> show you, I, I will explain um, some of the details of um, uh, our study paradigm to um, explore the functionality of this deeper self-access. In some of our studies, we asked participants to play the role of an administrator and choose from a list of more or less boring tasks which they would complete <clears throat> on this simulated hour of the working day. Subsequently, the experimenter, taking the role of the supervisor, recommended some other tasks. Later in the experiment, 
Participants were asked to indicate in the task list which they had chosen themselves and which tasks were recommended by the experimenter. In a recent study, <clears throat> we found that correct recall of external control, so when they correctly identified, oh, this was recommended, I didn't choose this, is associated with an activation of the left ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And um, correct recall of internal control, oh, I chose this myself, correct identification of self-chosen task is associated with an activation of the right ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Does this mean that the implicit self is always right? Of course, I mean it in the sense of right, having right hemispheric support, <clears throat> and that Freud's ego and superego receiving interjects from external sources such as parents, teachers, supervisors, is supported by left hemispheric process? Maybe this is the case. We have circumstantial evidence, at least. Our study revealed that activation of this region of the right ventromedial prefrontal cortex correlates negatively with a measure of impaired self-access. Negatively impaired self-access, so this region seems to be related to self-access. Alexithymia is this uh, measure. And positively with a measure of self-access that uh, Markus Quirin and I developed. And when participants had problems with self-other discrimination in this task, in this particular task, that is, when they misperceived tasks as self-chosen that had actually been recommended by the experimenter, both left and right ventromedial prefrontal cortex were activated. And in addition, a region of the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, ACC, was active during false, these false self-ascriptions. This region is, for instance, activated when participants are confronted with a mismatch or conflict. Self-infiltration yeah, is uh, an example. We uh, call uh, the, the, these false self-ascriptions self-infiltration. And um, I think uh, it is a matter of conflict. And we even found evidence for the conflict part of this uh, phenomenon. We found, in fact, some evidence for the claim that <clears throat> self-infiltration is associated with some unconscious conflict. The rate of false self-ascriptions in this particular task correlated with stress-dependent increase of cortisol in some other studies. Let me now turn to the second topic that I mentioned <clears throat> in my overview. I will briefly elaborate on some findings in the writings of philosophers which may illustrate the importance of the distinction between an explicit ego and an implicit self and the implication it has for concepts of rationality, autonomy and authenticity. Plato's Minu dialogue is my favorite. A good example for applying the implicit explicit distinction to the personal level. The dialogue begins with the following question. Can virtue be explicitly taught or is it acquired by implicit practice? Socrates argues that there is no way to define personal competences like virtue or justice in ab abstract terms. Yet he and Menon agree that paradoxically, for each specific instance of behavior, they can tell whether it's virtuous or not. Hmm, is this some implicit knowledge involved? In the course of the Mino dialogue, fundamental differences are revealed between explicit and analytical thought and implicit feeling or implicit behavior. Take these words by Socrates to Mino. I quote, this also explains why they, the politicians, are incapable of getting others to take after themselves. It's because they don't owe their political abilities to knowledge. In this context, Plato seems to use the term knowledge in the narrow sense of explicit knowledge. Part of the Mino uh, paradox can be resolved by distinguishing between two forms of knowledge, that is, explicit versus implicit knowledge. But when we extend the term knowledge to include implicit cognition, a new problem arises to anybody who wants to understand the functional basis underlying this and making this possible. Can implicit knowledge, and if the answer is yes, how? Can it be translated into explicit reasoning, or vice versa? Some 2,000 years after Plato, Immanuel Kant also reflected on the two different forms of cognition, 
which he called pure reason, related to the theoretical analytical thinking, and practical reason, which presumably underlies moral judgment. He apparently considered the latter much more complex compared to the former. I quote, two things fill the mind, many people know this favorite uh, end of the uh, cri critique of practical reason, with ever new and increasing admiration and reverence, the more often and more steadily one reflects on them the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. Now, from a psychological point of view, we may ask, do the starry heavens and the moral law have something in common? One similarity between the two relates to complexity. It can be argued that the complexity of cognitive processing underlying moral judgment is immense. How do we arrive at the insight that whether a given rule or principle like you should not, should not lie can be used as a general maxim, let alone how it should be modified to take the affordances and limitations of a specific context and a particular person into account, and, and that even without violating the deeper meaning of the principle. Incidentally, Jesus gave many examples for adapting a moral law to the specific context and person encountered. This context-sensitive adaptation would need re uh, and require multiple constraint satisfaction on a very high level of integration. One would have to perceive a host of possible consequences, individual potentials, limitations, in order to find a context-sensitive way to apply a moral principle without losing its deep meaning. Now, I invite you again to imagine that multiple constraint satisfaction on the level of the implicit self could tell us intuitively when an exception to the rule is compatible with its deeper meaning. Uh, we know from psychopathology that compulsive people have extreme problems with uh, just admitting to any exception to the rule. In this case, one question still remains. How could we communicate our reasons explicitly? So even if we postulate and, and would, would uh, say, okay, maybe it's possible, how can we communicate our reasons? This exacerbates the problem. Can complex implicit, uh, implicit knowledge be translated into the narrow categories of step-by-step -step explicit reasoning? Kant was very clear about that. The only thing we can know explicitly is the fact that moral, the fact that moral judgment works. According to Kant, the conscious result of moral judgment is the insight that a moral statement can be raised to a general maxim. And we, again, we can ask, how can we ever judge that? Come to this conclusion. But according to Kant, we cannot analyze how we arrived at this insight. We cannot know how moral judgment works. I quote, how pure reason could be practical to explain all this is quite beyond the power of human reason. And all the effort and work of seeking such an explanation is wasted. End of quote. Could this problem of pure reason to explain the deeper forms of moral judgment result from the fact that circumspect, context-sensitive moral judgment requires non-analytical implicit cognition, intuition, and that the processes underlying this implicit knowledge cannot be easily translated into analytical language? In his existential philosophy, Martin Heidegger criticized traditional analytic philo philosophy for not specifying the epistemological particularities of Dasein. But what is Dasein? In Heidegger's terms, I quote, the two kinds of being, of authenticity and inauthenticity, these expressions are terminologically chosen in the strictest sense of the word are based on the fact that Dasein is in general determined by always being mine. This being does not and never has the kind of being of what is merely objectively present in the world. His German word uh, was uh, Vorhandenheit, uh, a word that doesn't, uh, you, you wouldn't find it in the dictionary with many of Heidegger's word creations. <clears throat> 
Heidegger's word always being mine, je meinigkeit in German, doesn't exist in the dictionary, remind us of what psychologists call the self. The Greek word authentikos means self-completed, in contrast to externally controlled. The unique features of Dasein that he spelled out are similar to the four functional characteristics of the self that I mentioned. Circumspect care for one's existence, the connectedness with emotions and its unthematic status. He called it, he didn't talk about unconscious or implicit, but he said unthematic. Wonderful term, we could borrow it in psychology, as he preferred to call the implicit status of the self. And particularly, the fact that comprehensive care associated with Dasein is possible in an authentic or in an inauthentic mode. From a psychological point of view, the self can operate, in fact, in an authentic or in an inauthentic mode. The inauthentic mode is activated under stress, for instance, because access to integrative systems of the brain, notably the hippocampus and neocortical systems depending on it, is impeded beyond a critical stress level. It's uh, simply inhibited. Integrative systems facilitate uh, authenticity because being authentic means that one's action is supported by the entire person. We use this metaphor, the entire person. What does this mean in functional terms? Involvement of the entire person implies some sort of multiple constraint satisfaction. Integrating diverse inner voices, values, other self-defining contents, including the social context. I call the inauthentic mode vertical regression because the high-level systems of the neocortex related to goal pursuit, explicit intentionality, self-incongruence, self-congruence, etc., lose some of their impact on low-level systems such as affect, object perception, and habitual behavior. This top-down inhibition has the effect that one does things that one later regrets or fails to do things that should be done according to one's intuitive feeling. Um, Freud borrowed this idea of regression that he explained more in a developmental, with developmental um, metaphors from Pierre Janet, the French psychiatrist. With horizontal regression, complexity reduction occurs within the high levels uh, of processing that is, the person regresses from the self to the ego, for example, to avoid the emotionality of the self, I already mentioned this point, rather than to regress to low levels of personality organization. According to Jean-Paul Sartre, he was also, also men uh, mentioned by Gerhard Brundrup this morning, authenticity is simply an unrealistic ideal. People cannot but behave in an inauthentic way, and according to Sartre, they are aware of this inauthenticity. Um, I quote, empirical psychoanalysis is in fact based on the hypothesis of the existence of an unconscious psyche, which on principle escapes the awareness of the subject. Existential psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalysis rejects the hypothesis of the unconscious, end of quote. Today we are, we are more hesitant to reject the hypothesis of the unconscious when it comes to the intelligent unconscious, especially when we have reasons to postulate an intelligent, rational unconscious. The notion of a rational unconscious is in line with Heidegger's insight that moral reasoning, just like any other personally relevant insight, is based on some sort of implicit reasoning. Heidegger called it unthematic, as I said. The unthematic status of personally relevant insight implies that letting go of explicit reasoning and conscious control creates room for the intelligent personal unconscious. That is, psychologically speaking, the self. In this case, letting go of conscious control would facilitate self-determination and authenticity. You may even push this point one bend further and apply it to the case of authentic loss of control. Being authentic requires self-access, and self-access is facilitated by letting go of conscious control. 
So we can imagine adaptive sites of involuntary forms of loss of control. Even involuntary loss of control may sometimes facilitate, in the long run, self-access and self-growth. The two features of unconscious rationality and self-congruent authentic loss of uh, or release of control have another somewhat paradoxical implications. If personal decision-making can be based on intuitive integration of multiple constraints in a rational way, we are dealing with an unconscious form of volition as well. Unconscious volition? This may sound quite unusual. Isn't the concept of volition of a person's will inextricably associated with conscious awareness? The Italian-German philosopher Romano Guardini postulated two types of will. The familiar strict and narrow conscious will, and a less familiar, comprehensive and unconscious one. I quote, we would say that there are two kinds of will. Firstly, the one that approaches an explicit goal. It has something of an arrow, of moving, of moving sharply ahead. Besides the bright will, there is the dark one. Dark is not gloomy. Gloominess is bad. Darkness is good. Dark is the reasoning of the emotional mind and the movements of vibrant becoming. Our age has known for a long time the first type of will only. Everywhere we work with schedule, organization, with reason and technology, we see the consequences. We see how life dissolves. That's why we want to focus more on the second type of will. It is difficult to talk about it because it is quite alive. However, the words that refer to living things often appear vague to us. Well, we might be able to explain why they appear vague to us if something like um, very high level multiple constraint satisfaction in associative networks is involved. Let me briefly return to Plato. Postulating two forms of will, that is two first persons, imagine, two first persons, and I say I, what do I mean? I can mean two fundamentally different things. Solves a paradox that Plato made his students aware of. I quote, there is something ridiculous in the expression master of himself, ich beherrsche mich. For the master is also the servant and the servant the master. And in all these modes of speaking, the same person is it denoted, isn't it? End of quote. From a functional point of view, we may ask related questions. Who controls whom when I control myself? Who opens whom when I open myself? The paradox dissolves when we distinguish between the two first persons, for instance. An explicit one, which we call the ego, in, and a largely implicit one, the self. About 20 years ago, my colleagues and I conducted a study on the two forms of will. We call the strict, narrow, and conscious one self-control, and the comprehensive and largely unconscious form of volition self-regulation. Professor Brundrup already mentioned uh, ego control, so ego control or self-control. Ego control would even be more to the point because there the subject of the control mechanism is the ego according to this kind of reasoning. From our test battery for assessing about 80 personal competences, we selected a, a few self-report scales that are to distinguish between self-control and self-regulation. Participants who were interested in changing their dietary behavior were asked to keep a nutrition diary. One group of participants received a self-reward instruction that elaborated the message, please pay attention to even small steps towards success and reward yourself for your progress. Of course, that was a little bit elaborated. The second group received a self-punishment instruction that was summarized uh, with the sentence, please pay attention to even small drawbacks or difficulties and criticize yourself for each weakness, even in thought or imagery. As you can see from the figure, the reward group showed better action control and acted more of their intentions according to their diary. However, this finding applied for the self-regulation group only, the dark type of will, according to Guardini. That is for participants who utilize this comprehensive, largely unconscious form of will. 
In the self-punishment group that applied the strict and conscious form of volition, the self-punishment instruction generated consider considerably better action control, whereas self-reward impaired uh, volitional efficiency. How can one explain this paradoxical reversal? In the context of the theory that guided our research, that is personality systems interaction theory, PSI theory, the answer might be this. The self-punishment instruction induced the strict interjected form of self-management or of ego control. For people who would usually prefer the democratic mode, that strict instruction would impair action control because they are less likely to accept that strict regime. But why should people who would normally lean toward the strict type of self-management show impaired action control when they receive the encouraging self-regulation instruction based on self-reward? They don't take any advantage from, from self-reward, from positive thinking. Presumably, to the contrary, presumably strict self-controllers are not very likely to incorporate their goals into the self because they rely on the narrow scope of the ego suppressing the self that could only distract. When the self-reward instruction opens their selves, they are distracted by the many temptations and alternative options, but their intention is not in there. With regard to interventions in coaching or therapy, this of course is a big challenge when you, when you look at this. Uh, positive psychology, only for half of, the, of, you, of, of humans. We concluded that one should prepare self-controlled people for the possibility that positive thinking and self-reward may initially interfere with their action control. So that could already help if, we, if they can anticipate that, that there might be a little risk. Doctors sometimes, uh, medical doctors, have a similar uh, strategy. Clients having a strong bias towards strict self-control rather than comprehensive self-regulation would need a special treatment to enjoy the benefits of positive thinking and personal autonomy. They should be trained in self-compatibility checking, how we call that. That is checking whether their intentions are self-congruent. This training includes the development of personal autonomy Specifically here, the inner freedom to abandon or to modif modify a goal or an intention if it turns out to be self-incompatible. This enhances the chance that their goals and intentions are integrated into their selves. Now in the final part of my presentation, I will briefly reflect on some psychological implications of the interaction between ego and self. Recall Kant's question as to how moral reasoning and uh, we might add any form of implicit personal decision making could ever be translated into analytical language. Note that an interaction between ego and self is not necessary for all self-competences. Many tasks can be solved either on the basis of intuitive experience or by, analytical, uh, by any analytical procedure. A typical example, when I write a paper in foreign language, I might apply grammar rules that I learned at school or alternatively, I simply rely on my linguistic intuition. However, there are self-competences that require an interaction between an analytical and intuitive uh, processing system. From a personality perspective, this is the case for two pivotal self-competences related to action control and self-growth. I briefly give you an idea of this part of the theory. Let me first turn to action control. What are the system's requirements for being able to enact even unpleasant uh, intentions? Here is, in a nutshell, the answer spelled out by PSI theory. For action control, we need an interaction between some sort of prospective memory that prevents forgetting an explicit intention before it can be enacted, and we need a system that controls behavior. Behavior control is largely intuitive. We are not aware of all the processing details that control motor behavior, allowing for fast adaptive responses to environmental changes. The second key self-competence that is self-growth, learning from mistakes and painful experiences, also requires some interaction between an explicit and intuitive system. Why? As a first step, of any self-growth cycle, one has to focus explicitly on the negative detail or object rather than defensively avoiding or embellishing it. In PSI theory, this is the task of the object recognition system. 
The second step towards self-growth consists of bringing the isolated explicit experience in contact with the extended experiential network of the implicit self, which helps, for instance, to find ways of constructive coping, because it's a huge extended experiential knowledge base. What did we find out about the antecedents of those explicit implicit interactions? We have published quite a few studies confirming the pivotal assumption of PSI theory that the shift between opposing emotional states facilitates interactions between explicit and implicit systems. Intention memory is associated with a feeling of tension, which includes um, a more inhibited, impaired um, positive affect, a dampening of positive affect. In the figure, this is indicated by the smiley that doesn't smile. On the other hand, behavioral enactment requires shifting from that low to high positive affect. Even in animals, high positive affect, the reward system uh, is uh, um, one of the preconditions for behavioral enactment. The conditions for self-growth, such as self-access, self-other discrimination, or constructive coping with aversive events, is facilitated by a shift away from negative affect that is aroused when one explicitly focuses on an aversive event, the blue system, to a relaxed state that facilitates intuitive self-access. In some of our published studies, the modulation of assumption of systems interactions by a shift between contrasting emotional states was confirmed for implicit measures of affect only, not for explicit measures. Now, in the history of uh, further developments uh, in psychoanalysis, um, one interesting figure was Heinz Kohut. He noticed the lack of the self in Freud's ego-centered psychoanalysis. According to Kohut, from early on, the development of children's self requires mirroring. When a caretaker provides an explicit label for the child's implicitly, intuitively felt current state of mind, the child has a chance to connect explicit labels with an implicit state of mind. Is this the basis for the explicit system to learn mirroring implicit states, or is it even the beginning of crosstalk between implicit and explicit systems? I think it is. People know from everyday experience how important this mirroring is, and professionals use it in counseling, education, and therapy. When caretakers' explicit measures notoriously do not match the child's implicit feelings, implicit and explicit systems do not learn to communicate. Uh, we may even call it learned uh, dissociation. Examples for learned dissociations between explicit and implicit systems are the child is to conform to extrinsic achievement standards or moral norms, or is to fulfill a certain function. For instance, when the child is to make up for an unhappy marital relationship, we all need uh, know these uh, various things and know that they are not good ideas for um, healthy development. Here, we are after one possible reason why this is not so good. Without a functional model describing interactions between explicit and implicit systems involved in central self-competences, we would not necessarily think of the possibility that a student's procrastination problem, that is his impaired action control, can be an outflow of a lack of mirroring during childhood. Nor would we feel compelled to believe that explicit mirroring of implicit states during uh, therapy or coaching can improve action control competence again. In concluding, I would like to emphasize that there is a growing number of psychological and neurobiological studies on interactions between explicit and implicit systems. Much of this research explores the consequences of congruence or incongruence between, for example, explicit goals and implicit needs or motives. Despite this promising research, we still know very little about the functional details underlying crosstalk between explicit and implicit systems. How can a balanced, non-hierarchical interaction between explicit and implicit systems be developed? What are the developmental precursors of interactions? For example, when the explicit analytical ego enslaves the implicit self, or when the implicit self reduces the ego to the task of invent justifications 
for one's emotional world. To be honest, I think that Heidegger's very strange, uh, appalling um, admiration of the Nazi regime, uh, at least in the beginning, um, may be attributable to this particular form of interaction between intuition and logical thinking. Clear, when, 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 when clear and very highly po uh, potent, ca capable, analytical thinking is under the control of, in, uh, of low level intuition, bad things can come out. However, in the long run, we need to bring the two sources of rational judgment together um, and find out how balanced interaction between them is, uh, can be supported. Some 70 years ago, the Austrian novelist Robert Musil arrived at a similar conclusion when he wrote, we do not have too much intellect and too little soul, but we have too little precision in matters of the soul. I thank you for your attention. Thank you.